Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground is brought to you by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Hi, and welcome to this week's edition of Common Ground. I'm your host, Ashley Hall. Common Ground is a weekly series that highlights northern and central Minnesota culture. Each week we'll explore the unique people, places, and events that are an important part of our region. Each week, Common Ground videographers, editors, and myself will take viewers on a journey of exploration into the worlds of art, history, and culture. This week, meet Steph Maroka of Aiken, who shows us her illustrating and watercolor techniques. Members of the Bemidji Curling Club give us a lesson on curling, and meet Tony Powers of Brainerd, who shows us how graffiti, when done tastefully, can be eye-catching and beautiful. I'm Stephanie Maroka, and I've been painting for about professionally for about 10 years. This is how I start very, as, as little as like, a few lines as possible, but just to kind of have a guide. And then I'm going to put a horizon line in here, just a very light one, so I have a guide. Then what I have to do is, on certain paintings, in certain areas, I do what's called masking. Wherever the waxy part was touching remains that previous color, in that case white. And you do that over and over again. So it's protecting whatever is underneath it. So what I'm going to do now is wet the paper. Because it's watercolor, so you need water, right? We're going to make it really wet underlying colors in the universe for people are yellow, red, and blue, which are our primary colors. So I usually do a little underpainting with those colors. Watercolor doesn't wait. It does what it wants to do and it dries in its own way. So you do kind of have to work quickly to get the job done. And then you have to wait for it when it's ready, not when you're ready. I'm going to have to, I'm going to turn this up. I want it to have, have the heaviest color at the bottom, so we'll let it drip that way. When watercolor dries, it always dries lighter, so it's hard to know what it's really going to look like. It's just such a beast. I'm just going to put a little cloud in there. Okay, now I better get to that shoreline. I like 300 pound paper. It gives you a little more time when the paper is drying. You get more time because it's so thick it'll take longer to dry. I like it to be heavier because I have a little more time. And um, it doesn't ripple so much. Okay, so that, that looks doesn't look like a shoreline, but that's more of that underpainting I was talking about with the reds and the yellows. I think I better put some pine trees in now. Let's put a few pine trees in. I've been painting all my life. Um, ever since I was a child. And it's just something I've always aspired to do. So I'm lucky enough to be doing it, more or less. It's tough economic times right now. but people always need beautiful art to look at and make them feel happy. That's what I think. Inspiration comes at any moment. It's basically from just connections in my life that, you know, that we all have our experiences that we've had and sometimes, sometimes I just see something and 
put the connection together and I see a picture I want to paint. That's where it comes from. I have um, a lot of different experiences from where I learned to paint. I took some classes in college, but it was not my major. Uh, I've taken workshops from master painters I admire. You can always pick something up that way. So practicing, learning, talking to people, looked at books. But basically, for the most part, I am self-taught. Kind of put some shadows in. I'll put some birch trees in now. And the flat part of this brush can do a lot of different shapes. I'm going to take my little brush and do a few more of those um, pine trees. It's not too late. That chickadee's waiting and waiting. It's just going to have to wait some more. The water is a big wash as well, like the sky. to get it all wet again. Here's where preserving the white of the paper is important because now I'm going to be going over it with this blue. I'm going to be going over the area I masked out. Yep, you can see this is lighter than when I put it on. Well, I think that's just fine. So... This is dark. I think it could be a little bluer. Of course, it's a reflection of the sky, so I'd like more of that cobalt, I guess. Cut out this little shoreline area. I'm now drawing, or I'm cutting out the branch, right, cutting right through the color before it dries completely. So I could make a little branch for him to sit on. Subtle under color. All right, now let's see if I can get some little cute little things. No, oh, it's too too dark. Now we can take off this masking. And I have a little tool here that's a big piece of uh, piece of rubber, and it'll pick up I can just pull that right off. And I think I'll finish by doing his feathers and finishing the chickadee. I just want to soften it up underneath his chin. So I had a drawing. It's going like this. I still have masking on the, this part. I need to build up the twigs more. But this is the idea. I'm just gonna put a little dot of acrylic on his eye. Give him a sparkle. There it is. I would call this one bird's eye view, I guess. My name is Tony Powers. I have been doing art as long as I can remember since I was a little tiny kid painting and building stuff and making stuff and going out in the woods and making stuff and just all over. Love what I do, definitely. I do lots and lots of mural work. Um, that's airbrushing, I do uh, spray painting, I do hand painting, I do, uh, we do a lot of things with the school. We teach an art club in Cross Lake. We, uh, try to show kids that they can be free with art as possible because it's definitely a very freeing field and you just got to have fun and 
not ever really take it too seriously because if you take it too seriously, you get mad when you don't do it right. The first mural job I got was um, Jurassic Auto Wash opened in town and they had heard that I was uh, an airbrush artist and I just kind of picked up a couple airbrushes from eBay and figured out how to how to do that a little bit and they hired me on for a really really huge project and so I kind of learned a lot of what I learned by doing that and after I did one really really big job lots of people just kind of started seeing my stuff and kind of started wanting it too and I like to do as much stuff as I can so so I try to um, I did a mural up at the Cross Lake School in the library. There's, um, there's no windows in the room, and uh, it's just kind of really dark in there. And so I put a giant window on the wall. That's pretty cool because now the kids can kind of look at the wall, and it looks like they can be outside where it's really nice, and there's lots of happy little animals and stuff like that. And uh, two of the oxes and the ox trot I helped work on, and those were pretty, pretty weird just because. How many times in your life do you get to paint on an ox? It's kind of weird. And I've always been into spray painting, ever since I was a little kid, you know. Picking up the, the, cheap, the cheap cans at Fleet Farm when we were little kids and painting our, painting our little pedal bikes and stuff. We were gonna do something out on the building and it was snowing this morning. So, so spray paint doesn't work in anything other than uh, 40 and above, so. So it's not gonna work out today that we go outside, so. So we'll just do an inside thing. And I had an extra piece of paneling from when we did the wood, the walls, so. First, first really, really important question is color. You gotta kinda pick out what color stuff you're gonna do first. Cause that really brings it all together. And, and I decided to do a, like a blue octopus today. And so I did, made the water a different color because I didn't want it to be blue too because I would have just blended in. And everybody always does water blue, so. So we figured we'd do the water green today. Then you think about background color too on top of the regular color because you don't want it to just be flat on the wall. I like to put stuff behind stuff to make it stand out a little bit more. And with doing it outside, there's other obvious things we have to look at. We can't make it very lewd or anything. There's obviously public content that has to be considered. And I don't know, pretty much when I do it, it depends on what I'm doing it for. For the outside of this building, it'll probably all just be really fun, silly stuff, just because it can be like that. You know, and it, a lot of it's commissioned, so there's a little bit less of my thought that goes into it as more of a morph of somebody else's idea into my thought, so. I like to take other people's ideas and make them, make them more than they could think that it would be, you know? And another big thing that has to be considered is medium, too. I mean, if I'm gonna go and do something like this with spray paint, it's gonna be kind of a little bit more of a, kind of a, a more of a cart cartoon style, almost, with like thicker, broader outlines and lots of real big, thick pieces of singular color as opposed to doing something like more like a, a realist thing where you do lots and lots of mixing and stuff. Sometimes I just put the can on the wall and whatever happens, happens. And sometimes there's a definite idea that goes into it. It all depends on the day. Sometimes you can have a design ready to and get up to that wall and that design doesn't feel right and you just don't end up doing it that day. Which is cool. It's pretty free. And the cool thing about spray paint is you can always just go over it. You just spray paint right back over it and it's gone forever. It's pretty easy. Pretty uh, impermanent artwork. But I mean, some of this is graffiti paint, some of it's Rust-Oleum, some of it's Krylon. It all just kind of depends on what you're going for. And you know, you gotta look for paint that's not gonna run too much and you gotta look for stuff that's gonna, you know, depending on where you're doing it too, you don't want it to be too toxic. If you're doing it like inside a, a house or something like that, you don't want to stink up somebody's house for a week. Because spray paint can be pretty, pretty stinky stuff sometimes. You know, sometimes people get a little bit offended by it. Sometimes it's a little bit too much for people. Some people seem to really, really like it. Some people could, could care less about it. Some people don't like to give 
spray paint the, the time of day because it's spray paint, you know? And it's not fine artwork in some people's eyes. There's a lot of people that just think it's vandalism, but that's because of what they've seen, you know, and that all has to do with exposure, probably. I think, I think that I would definitely be satisfied if people started thinking that it was a little bit more of a hard thing to do, because it's, it's a lot harder than some people think it is. And, and some people think, you know, because it's not done with oils or with a brush, like some of the, the masters have done, that it's not artwork, you know? But it's all your own interpretation, I guess. You know, some murals take, I think the longest one I ever worked on took probably about 16 hours. 16, 17 hours for a really, really, really big piece. And that was done, a lot of it was done by hand, with hand brushing and with some airbrushing and stuff. And Sometimes spray painting is uh, definitely a way to go for large coverage in a quick time, which is kind of one of the cool things about it. And now we'll go back in with the airbrush and tighten it up a little bit. You know, I really like the large scale of it all. I like being able to use my whole arm and my whole body to do painting instead of just having to use my, my hand and my wrist. It's kind of nice to be able to do full full movements. And I just like it because you can see it from 100 feet away and still be able to see it. Study a lot before you just start throwing stuff up on walls because that's kind of one of those things that's going to, you know, determine what people think about the artwork that you're doing. And if you're not doing anything that's, you know, deemable as artwork, if you're just writing your name really bad and writing slurs, then it's not gonna be any good. But if you're really, really into it, then you know, just start looking into it, start studying, start practicing with different tips, start practicing on, on different stuff. And typically, our work that I do with spray paint gets signed with uh, that name and that's Old, old Soul. That's like my spray paint name. <laughs> If you're into artwork and you're into learning how to do this kind of stuff, just never ever go up. Try as hard as you can and you'll probably make it. I started curling in, in 1956 and I've been curling ever since through 2010. So far I'm still going strong, I guess. In 1956, I guess I curled at a Paul Bunyan bond spiel. I'd come down with my dad, and there was a team that was short of players, so they asked if I would curl, and that's how I got started. I was on a team, and we actually won, I think, the third or fourth event. I won a blanket back then, so I can still remember it. I have a picture at home, as a matter of fact. Back in 1956, the club was downtown on Urban Avenue, but it was natural ice, and we don't have the artificial ice like they have now, so it was really some slow ice compared to now. You would come down there on a cold weekend in the middle of January or something, and I'll tell you, there'd be frost on it. You'd have to throw that rock as hard as you could to get it down. And you could never, it was never the same from one day to the next where this natural or artificial ice is now. And what a difference that made for curling. It's really enjoyable. Well, it started in uh, 1936, came to Bemidji. Hibbing had got it in 1913. They were forerunners. Came to Bemidji and it was in a two sheet building down around where uh, where Senex is located right now. And I don't know the exact location, but it was right down around 2nd Street. It was a two sheet. Then it moved there, moved up to the, and attached itself to the skating rink, which is where Northland Apartments is at. And that was actually a separate uh, building, although it was attached to the, to the skating rink. And it stayed there till 1967, and the city said they wanted to uh, build a, uh, a government housing type, financed by government housing uh, dollars down there, and they would give us the land to come here and attach to the skating rink. That was 1967, I believe. I wasn't here, but that's what I've been told. So we, uh, we, uh, we built the building, paid for the building on the city land, which you can have, and then uh, shortly after that, the skating or the curling club gave it to the city. So it's kind of under their umbrella, you might say. 
I uh, actually curled one time uh, back in the uh, 50s when I was going to college. I don't remember much about it, but I remember the old, uh, the old rink down there, and I remember I uh, curled for the Bemidji Woolen Mills. We had these beautiful jackets, Eisenhower type jackets and matching hat. It was very nice. And then I went uh, and did my thing for 30 some years and I came back in 91, so I've got uh, about 20 years in uh, since that time. Oh, I think meeting all the different curlers from different clubs and our own, you know, watching them progress and, you know, curling against some of these people like the Paul Bunyan's coming up, you meet a lot of Canadians and they, they invented the sport, so to speak. I mean, they come down and they'll make shots that you don't even anticipate trying yourself. You know, try them and make them. So it's been a real pleasure to curl against that type of curler. But we've had some good ones here, so the fact we've been able to curl the Scotty Bears and the Lupsex and some of these Pete Fensons. You know, you've, you've grown up with these champions around us, so you do have a little higher playing field here, I think, than probably some other clubs. I did watch my dad. He was from Duluth, and I didn't know until he passed away. We were digging through some of the uh, paperwork, and he'd been a state, not a state, a club champion in Duluth. And I have curled here all my life, trying to be a club champion in Bemidji, and have never accomplished that. So when I see what he'd done when he was 18, 19 years old, it was amazing because Duluth had a lot of curlers compared to Bemidji back then. But uh, yeah, so it's been in the family ever since uh, I've grown up with it. And it's a great pastime, good exercise, and great people to curl with. Guys like Buck are fun to be around when you're out there curling. Yes, I love curling with my dad. It was always a thrill. I think he enjoyed the sport. Uh, and he was up in his uh, almost 79, I think, was the last year that he curled. And he was competitive. He'd come down here on Thursdays when we have uh, four draws and sometimes he'd curl all four. And now when I come down, I curl twice and I can't believe that he could do it four times. But he would do that and it was just part of how physical he was, I think, in that generation probably too. But we really loved the sport and I love being with the old dad curling. Well, I'm competitive, <laughs> you know. I think we, uh, we like to have a good time, uh, but we understand you're gonna get beat. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some people don't maybe like that. But uh, we understand that uh, we're going to be in a competitive situation. When we get down with a stone in front of us, we want to make the best shot possible. The climate up here is, is conducive. Uh, you're, we're sitting right next to a major skating facility that uh, not only has a lot of figure skating, but young hockey players and inverse. Even the colleges even used it for a few times when they didn't have their ice uh, at that particular day. So, uh, yeah, this building was, is important. The city uh, fathers like curling and are very uh, giving to us as far as the facility and everything. Yeah, I think uh, the exposure of the Olympics though really started at larger. You know, it's been here a long time, but I think that exposure of Pete Fenson winning our only Olympic medal in, for the United States was pretty, pretty important for it. To me, one of the most thrilling things that I saw, I had, I had wintered in Texas and we got back here uh, after uh, the Olympics and uh, the Nationals were going on here. We just got back in town. And so I got the in on about the last two days of the Nationals. And Lenny will remember this, the last rock thrown by Pete Fenson to win the national, went on the button, in the center of the ring. Yeah. And that, and the whole place just burst, <laughs> you know, like, it was a pretty thrilling time to see an athlete perform like that. Yeah, I think he was pretty happy, but we were <laughs> also happy. You know, one thing about, it, we get to curl against all those guys, you know, they're, they're in the leagues. We get to curl, we get to curl in this championship ice that they provide for us, so I think, uh, we're cl a lot closer to maybe our competitive curlers than, than you would think because we know them quite, quite well and have played with most of them. You know. Well, I think it's something that's been handed down from one generation to the next. And we've had so many good curlers. I mean, the uh, Bairds and the Halupsics and all these people that in the past have been state and national champions. Uh, and of course, the Johnson girls, Cassie and Jamie, that uh, Pete Fenson, that those people that had gone to the Olympics. I think it's just something that's passed down and uh, the future looks real good with the younger curlers coming up. I think the Midgie's going to continue to be a factor in the national curling. Well, I think it's pretty great to see him come up through the junior ranks. We just had the national juniors here. Just fantastic curling. I mean, 
when they when they hit a stone, it was just by half an inch or so. Yeah, to see them develop young people uh, into uh, very fine curlers, yeah. And also to see their character develop. I think the character is pretty important in this game. Uh, what kind of athlete you are, you know, what kind of person. Oh, we did. We Ooh, ooh. Okay, it's open. Okay. Wide open. Well, in conclusion, I guess it's a sport that I would recommend to anybody. I think it's uh, not only from the exercise, but the chance to meet great people and have a tremendous time out here. It's uh, a lifetime sport, something that'll be with most curlers until they can't hardly walk anymore. And the exercise and the uh, long winters we have, boy, they aren't as long when you have curling and have leads like this. It makes it go by very fast. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's show and we look forward to seeing you next week right here on Common Ground. If you have a segment idea for Common Ground, please contact us at legacy at lptv.org or call us at 218-333-3022. or copies of Common Ground, please call 218-333-3020. Production funding for Common Ground is made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. If you enjoyed this segment of Lakeland Public Television's Common Ground, consider making a contribution at lptv.org.